Hi, my name is Megan Maddox, an employee here at PCC, and I'm going to speak to you today about the 21st Century Cures Act and information blocking. Today's presentation is meant to be um, an introduction and an overview to um, the new regulation. Okay, so topics we're going to cover today. First, again, we'll provide a definition and an overview of information blocking. We'll talk about what it means to access, use, and exchange electronic health information, also referred to as EHI. And um, last, we'll talk about how to prepare for compliance. So let's start with some real world examples. Um, the first one on the list is a healthcare organization or hospital system refusing to exchange information with a non-affiliated organization or physician practice. Also, another example, a provider has the capability to provide same-day access to EHI, but takes several days to respond. Um, another example, requiring patient consent to exchange their electronic health information for treatment when it's not a required, required by law. A certified health IT developer refuses to share technical information needed to export data. An HIN or HIE, which if they charge additional fees to exchange um, with non-members or people who are non-affiliated with them, that is information blocking. And last but certainly not least, charging a patient um, money for electronic access to their health data is information blocking. Okay, so now that we've talked about some real world examples, let's look at the statutory language. So this, the um, Congress passed the 21st Century Cures Act in December of 2016. It is a huge piece of legislation and within it are the information blocking provisions. So information blocking, um, in summary, is a practice that is likely to interfere with prevent or materially discourage access, exchange, or use of electronic health information unless such practice is required by law, for example, HIPAA or SAMHSA, or meets an exception established through rulemaking. So we'll talk about, again, access, use, exchange, and we'll also talk about um, the exceptions. All right, first let's talk about requests. This is very much, this regulation is request driven. So this rule does not require providers or other entities to release all information as soon as they get it, release it out, or release it out at all. Um, rather, it's centered around responding and fulfilling requests to access, exchange, or use electronic health information. So we can look at those definitions a little bit closer. Um, access is making that EHI available for exchange use or both. Exchange is transmitting that electronic health information between and among technology, systems, and platforms or networks. And use, the ability to understand um, and act upon the EHI you've received. So I know as we exchange data today, I'm sure you appreciate it when your fellow providers out there in the healthcare ecosystem give you clean data. Um, so it's about using, it's really about taking care of the patient and exchanging data that benefits them and you. Okay, let's move on. So a uh, quick rundown of the government agencies that are affiliated with this law. As I mentioned earlier, Congress of course passed the piece of legislation and then dictated to these agencies to act upon it. So in the Department of Health and Human Services, we have the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. They um, historically have overseen cert uh, certified and health IT vendors, um, and they create and oversee that health IT certification that vendors achieve. They also wrote and published um, this information blocking final rule. Then there's the Office of the Inspector General, who, whose main purpose is to combat waste, fraud, and abuse, and they will investigate information blocking allegations made against certified health IT vendors and exchange networks. Then of course, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, they are our largest public payer and arbiter of the annual fee schedules, the quality payment program, promoting and promoting interoperability, formerly known as uh, meaningful use. So they tie together 
with the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT because to qualify for those incentive programs, you've had to use certified health IT. What this rule does is expands the jurisdiction of the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT to now impose regulations on you, the provider population, and networks and exchanges. It's unprecedented that as providers, you've had to pay attention to them um, in, in a larger capacity than using certified health IT. So um, take note, and it's important, and we'll teach you. Okay, the information blocking actors. So the, um, these are the people and the entities who are subject to the rule. I've mentioned each of them throughout, but I wanted to call this out specifically. So there are healthcare providers, which is um, all of you that I'm speaking to now, um, our clients. They're uh, certified health IT vendors. So PCC is not technically subject yet because we do not have 2015 edition certification, um, but are certainly talking about that. And then health information networks and exchanges. And this is great news because it's going to increase that flow of data. Um, and I also want to circle back up to the, you, the provider community, and regardless of whether you use a certified product or not, you are subject to this rule. Um, again, as I mentioned just a moment ago, it's unprecedented that the ONC has um, done this, but nonetheless, it's happening, and all for good reason. Um, but before we get to that, I wanna talk about the penalty structure for a moment. So um, Congress passed the law, and within that, they outlined some penalties, but not all of them. You'll see a lot of TBDs on this slide. So you'll, um, the ONC final rule compliance date is April 5th, 2021. However, the penalty structure is um, still in development. Also important to note that the original compliance date was November 2nd of 2020, but because of the response to the global COVID pandemic, they, the ONC put out an interim final rule and pushed that date out a bit to allow all actors more time for compliance. So we have the three actors listed, healthcare providers, certified health IT vendors, and HIEs, HINs, and then the enforcement agency and the penalties and start date. So first, healthcare providers. The enforcement agency will be the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, and um, that is still an unknown. So the penalties are unknown, and the start date is unknown. Expect, we will expect there to be a proposed rule with a public comment period at some point. We don't know what that point is yet. And then um, the other two actors, certified health IT vendors and HIEs, HINs, um, the enforcement agency over they, them is the um, Office of the Inspector General. The penalties are up to $1 million per infraction of information blocking. And uh, the start date is to be determined there was a proposed rule for this uh, put out last fall or in the fall of 2020. There was a public comment period, and we have not seen a final rule come out yet. So while there's a lot to be determined on this slide, the most important thing is, is that the compliance date still starts on April 5th, 2021, regardless of if the, um, the sticks are known and the punishment is known. Okay. Now let's talk about the good part, because the intent of this is good. It's important. Um, Congress passed this with the patient in mind. So the intent of this is to, as you can see in the center, improve healthcare outcomes. Um, we want uh, the healthcare ecosystem to share more data, both between and among providers. It's meant to promote competition, um, which will lead to better healthcare in theory and uh, have patients have increased access to their health information. And then of course, like I said at the beginning, all at the center is an improve, improved healthcare, healthcare outcomes. Okay, so back to the rule. Um, there's three, three buckets or three focus areas of the rule. There's part 171, which is the majority of what we've been, what I've been speaking about today, and it is information blocking. It's the prohibition of interfering with access, exchange, and use of electronic health information. Then there's part 170. 
that's broken into two areas. Um, and part 170, the first one is health IT certification. So they've, out of all of the different criterions that health IT vendors certify to, some are retired that are very common, uh, some are revised, and there are some new ones. And then along with that, the conditions and maintenance of certification have been expanded upon, um, and there are six requirements. So just wanted to create an awareness there. Um, but really, again, the focus of this presentation is around part 171 and um, information blocking in general. All right, some new terms to be familiar with. So first, the USCDI. It stands for the United States Core Data for Interoperability. USCDI is easier to roll off the tongue. Um, it's a standardized set of health data classes and elements for interoperable health information exchange. And um, it's not all entirely new. All the data elements that are included in the exchange, the CCDA um, document exchange now are included in there and um, are called the common clinical data set. And the USCDI includes the common clinical data set and more. And it will go through an annual commenting and expansion process where anyone can comment on items that should be included in there. And the ONC listens very well and includes them. So then the second term is EPHI, so Electronic Protected Health Information. Um, this represents the same data that a patient would have the right to, act, right to request co a copy of pursuant to the HIPAA privacy law. Um, the other important note here is that until October 6, 2022, information blocking is limited to the data elements included in the US CDI. And after October 6, 2022, the information blocking requirements expand to include all EPHI. And you might be wondering why that arbitrary date? It ties to when certified health IT vendors have to implement, um, have to meet some of their milestones. So that's where that's coming from. Next, I just want to give you a visual. This is from um, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT's website, their, their USCDI website specifically. And um, this is just a half of a snapshot of their data classes and data elements. So you can see data classes include laboratory, medication, smoking status, and then the data element would be the data elements captured. So tests, uh, values, or results or that smoking status. So whole website out there, um, encourage you to go and look at it. So now let's talk a bit about information blocking and how it intersects with other regulations that are out there. So information blocking does not supersede HIPAA, SAMHSA, or other state and regional regulations. Um, HIPAA also includes the intent to provide patients access to their health information while protecting and securing it and information blocking in a way complements that and enhances it. Um, and remember the P in HIPAA is for portability. So while these are all federal laws, um, always, always check with your local and state laws for additional regulations to ensure compliance and um, even more so when, um, when dealing with minors, as you all are. Okay, another piece of the rule, exceptions. So Congress, tasked the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, ONC, to define the negative, to define when it's okay to break this rule, so to speak, because there will be times when it's clinically appropriate and warranted to not send information. So what ONC did is they defined eight exceptions of when it may be appropriate to not comply with the information blocking rule or alter the way in which EX, EHI is accessed, exchanged, or used. So they broke them into two buckets. There's exceptions that involve not fulfilling a request at all, and other exceptions and procedures for fulfilling a request, but maybe in a different way. So exceptions that involve not fulfilling requests include preventing harm, privacy, security, infeasibility, and health IT performance. And then exceptions and procedures for fulfilling um, an, a request for EHI in a different way include content and manner, which is the what and the how, fees and licensing. And I'll talk about content and manner for just a moment. So 
say you get a request for something that you do not have the capability of um, providing in an electronic fashion, you, but you could send it in a PDF or, or, a, or print it out or even snail mail. That would be the content is the what, you're still fulfilling it, but the manner in which you're doing that is different than an electronic format. Okay, I um, want to encourage all of you to read these in more detail. ONC has fact sheets available. And of course, there's the final rule itself, which is has all the details. Um, while this is one slide in this presentation, these are um, extensive and uh, worth giving another look to. Okay, so other ways to prepare. Here's a list I'll run through of things that you can start doing now to prepare, prepare for that April 5th compliance date. I would encourage you to review and update policies that include information about data access, exchange and use. So your HIPAA, your HIPAA policy, for example. Um, review your existing fee structure. While reasonable fees are permissible for some activities, charging a patient for electronic access to their health information is prohibited. So the, the term reasonable is in quotations because that's the language the rule uses. They don't want to, they have no intention of dictating market prices. However, um, those who have used predatory practices in the complaints that they got, um, that's what the ONC is trying to address. So, and the one thing we know is strictly prohibited is ever charging a patient for electronic access to their records. That is very clear. All right, moving on. Um, also, appoint an information blocking officer. While this is not a, a requirement of the regulation, it's always ideal to have someone in your practice as a point person um, to review and update the policies and to be there to answer questions. Um, also, as I mentioned on the last slide, review those information blocking exceptions and define policies to use them. Determine where and how the exceptions will be documented, logged, and retained. And uh, last but certainly not least, teach everyone in your practice and organization how to recognize and act upon a request to access, exchange, and use electronic health information. You're doing this every day in your practice, um, but just want to bring that to the forefront with the new regulation. All right, this slide is also from the um, Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT's website. It is, the, it is key, key regulatory dates that are for the most part aimed towards certified health IT vendors. So you'll see when um, different pieces of certification are due to be um, developed. The reason why I'm showing you this one is because we have a key date of um, April 5th, 2021 for when information blocking in general goes into effect. And then the other takeaway on this slide is that you can see the timeline stretches out into 2023. So it'll be a while before as this ramps up and then it will normalize and become a part of our, um, our daily lives. Okay, uh, one of the last things I wanna do is go through a couple of questions that we've received and talk through those. So, one question, do we have to make all of our lab results accessible to patients in the portal? So it's not a requirement of the rule to make all the lab, all lab results or all notes or all anything accessible to the portal. Um, it's your choice to do so or not. You, it doesn't say, it um, doesn't say yes or no. What, again, what it's about is fulfilling requests. So if a patient requests their labs via the portal and you do not provide them but have the capability to do so, that would be information blocking. Um, you must acknowledge and respond to all of the requests for EHI. And if you're unable to fulfill them in the manner in which they're requested, you'll wanna look at those exceptions and see if that fits. There's also um, a link to the, uh, on the ONC website for those information blocking exceptions I would encourage you to go and look at. The next question. Our clinicians store confidential information in various places in PCC EHR. Do we need to make all of those notes available to patients? So very similar to the other question, um, this is about fulfilling requests. It's not about automatically sending every piece of information, but if a patient asks for it, then you need to, to deal with that and respond to that. Um, and also very important to note, that, again, the information blocking rule does not supersede HIPAA privacy and security rules 
or the substance abuse and mental health law, those are still all in effect and your state and local laws. Need to plug that every chance I get. Um, so some, again, there's fact sheets and the ONC has an FAQ as well. And they do address a um, question regarding confidentiality when the patient is a minor. So um, I would encourage you to check that out. Then the last Q&A, do we need to enable portal access to our patients if they request it? Yes. Um, if a patient requests portal access, it must be granted if you have the portal enabled. Additionally, if your practice does not have the portal enabled, it is strongly recommended that you do so. Um, if you do not have um, it enabled during the time when you're implement implementing it, you may choose to use infeasibility or rather content and manner and um, get people their health information in a different way. But uh, it is not recommended to use that exception for an extended period of time, given the fact that you, through PCCEHR, have the ability to use the portal. So highly encourage you to do so there. Okay, here are some additional resources. Um, there are some linked throughout the presentation and a list here, and we'll be sure to get those um, in an easy format for you to consume. Thank you for listening to the presentation. We're here to answer questions and um, do what we can to help you navigate this new regulation. So have a wonderful day and thank you. Bye.